Hello, welcome to Citizens Forum. It is Wednesday, June the 6th. I'd like to start by thanking the wonderful volunteers and Shaw staff that makes this show happen every two weeks. Um, we're starting off with climate change. Uh, my guest is Werner Simbeck. And uh, Werner, maybe you can start just by saying something about what the Pope recently or not so recently It was said. about a year ago he released a paper. I forget what the term is called. And it's really meant for all the Catholics in the world and also for everybody else. And the reason why he had a big, uh, he got together with all kinds of experts, climate change experts, from, social, from the scientific side as well as the social justice side. All over the world, people came to Rome and they participated in these meetings, conference, like another climate change conference. But, Didn't hear much about it. But headed by the Pope. By the Catholic Church. Oh. And, and then they had a report that was released after these discussions. The state of, of affairs, basically where we're at with climate change, where we're heading and what we need to be doing. And basically it was a wake-up call. The idea was it was a wake-up call for Catholics, but for everybody, all faiths. It's not just Catholics. It's just, it was interesting that it was the Catholic Church that did this. Trying to raise awareness that climate change is a serious threat to humanity. That, that's the language that you read out of that, that was used, that we need to get our act together. Basically, God's creation is, is at stake if we don't really address climate change and mitigation of climate change. And of course, now fast forward, here we are in Canada. We have the liberals in power. And okay, be, before forward, we fast forward. You don't forward, want to go there? No, we can go there. But <laughs> before we fast forward, I just want to compare the amount of corporate media coverage this information that you just talked about got compared to Stormy Daniels and Roseanne Barr and the Stanley Cup playoffs. So we can see that the media is not working in our interest. They are willing to have us killed in order for the corporations to make a few more bucks because that seems to be what, what's happening. Or, yeah, so so this, there's this paper by, by the Pope was I think last year or a year and a half ago. So it wasn't exactly at the same time what you were just sort of referring to. But typically it's true. The mainstream media may mention it, but it doesn't explain what it means. Do you know, do you know what I mean? Yes, the because, seriousness of it. Yes. It may make it in the headlines, page three, page four somewhere. But again, it doesn't get, ex nobody explains what it really means. What does that mean for the economy? What does it mean for the stock market, for What example? does it mean for the lives of your children? What does it mean for the future generations? That's what's at stake, actually. Not just human beings, but all life on Earth is threatened by our inactions and our ignorance. So now, if you may, if you let me, fast forward, we're in Canada here. Trudeau was, when he became our prime minister, there was the Paris conference, climate change conference, uh, organized by the IPCC, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change that the UN organizes every so many years, there's a big conference. He was there with all the other world leaders, it seems, big photo op, promising to the world that we're going to try to keep climate change to 1.5 degrees Celsius, but no more than 2 degrees warming. So the world agreed, basically all countries in the world, except maybe two, <laughs> and I can't remember what those two were now, they all agreed that we're going to address climate change. But it, this agreement didn't have any teeth. Basically, it was saying it was promises. Every country promised to do something about it. And we're going to hit 1.5 degrees, no, no more than 1.5 degrees warming since the beginning of in the Industrial Revolution. And Justin Trudeau, just as an example, he basically was all proud that he went there. You know, we had a new environment minister who has a fancy title. It includes the title of climate change in her title, which is great, you know. But here we are a year and a half later, almost two years, I guess, later, and we were building another pipeline. The federal government decided to help Kinder Morgan in securing this expansion project. But the science clearly says that we actually cannot no longer emit carbon dioxide anymore. We have to start removing it from the atmosphere in order to be safe. We already emitted so much of carbon dioxide already that if we, let, if we wait for equilibrium to occur, we'll be four degrees warmer. 
that's what's in the pipeline already, four degrees. Three, to, three and a half to four degrees is already in the pipeline. And we should mention that one and a half degrees is disaster. Well, Two degrees is... You could argue it's a disaster or not. But basically what's going to happen is people in poorer countries where it's dry and less developed, they're going to die first. They're going to have famine. They're going to be affected by high food prices. So it's mostly brown people. I hate to say it like this, but it's mostly brown people. You know, I hate that we're, we're not racist, right, are, are we? But the Western world, the, the developed world, basically is able to cope with a, a one and a half degree rise in temperature, theoretically. But the poor countries, the, develop, the developing countries, they're the ones who have to pay the price first. They'll hit the hardest them. You know, we're wealthy. We can afford higher food prices. They may not be able to afford Especially that. Especially when we're buying the food that they grow. That's exactly right. So, so, so here is, there's lives at stake, but, and the Pope thinks these lives are worth saving, hence this conference, hence this paper that he released not so long ago, trying to raise awareness. This is, some, this is something that we need to pay attention to. It's far more important than economic growth. That's what he's trying to say that we need to help everybody, all life on Earth, including fellow human beings living in third world countries. And forget, you know, it's not only the third world countries. We are going to get hammered here. We are yeah. going to get hammered. Well, we're going to have wildfires. We just started already really early. We had flooding. I mean, this is just the beginning. But we're a developed country. We have infrastructure. We, can, we have the military to come and help, help yeah. put sand in bags, you know, and, and, and clean up after a flood. But these countries that I'm talking about, nothing. they don't have any of that, yeah. right? They're on their own. So if the ocean level was to rise, for example, poor countries like Bangladesh, for example, I mean, you have millions of people that are suddenly without a home. Tens of millions, potentially hundreds of millions around the world if the ocean rises 20, 20 centimeters, which isn't as much. 20 centimeters? 20 centimeters, you know. I'm just saying, if it was to rise this much, a lot of them will be without land to grow food on. But it's potent the potential of ocean level rise, if we were not to do nothing right now, is four to five meters. Say that again. Like four to five meters. If we, if we do nothing. Do nothing. Yes. Which means, what is? If you, let, if, you, if you keep the concentration of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere the way it is right now, if we don't remove any of it. You mean we have to, we have to remove, not only not no, add. No, that's the point. That is exactly the point. This is why nobody pays attention, I think, anymore. Because either they're trying to ignore it. Yeah. Or they, they don't want to. This is a reality that nobody wants to have. We have already spent our carbon budget. We're overspent it, actually. Now we have, that's if you were to read the IPCC Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change report and read in there, it says the only way that we can save our soul if you, or save ourselves, if you were to remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and bring down the carbon dioxide concentration back down again to a level around 350. Hence, there's an organization called 350.org. But actually... Well, that's definitely what we should be doing. But we're building a pipeline, so that was Tell my point. It, so yes. we are building this pipeline. Now we bought an old pipeline that's 65, 65 years old. So for 65 years, we have removed fossil fuels from Alberta, brought it to the coast, refined some of it, shipped some of it abroad. If we build a new pipeline, will it last another 65 years? Is that the idea? So that basically what we're doing is we're, we're guaranteeing emissions. Canada is guaranteed these emissions to come if we were to build this pipeline, because now we have it in place. We can remove tar sands oil from Alberta and then sell there it. Won't the be a market. Market. Hmm? There won't be a market. There won't be a market for it. Well, I mean, we're all going to be dead if there's a market the, for it. There's, so. a, there's, two, there's two, two, two things. First of all, when you build the infrastructure, it requires tons of fossil fuel input. Right? Yes, there are 2,000 jobs maybe yeah. created here and there building this pipeline. But the emissions of building the pipeline is one thing. Yeah. But then when running the pipeline, the emissions, even though if we can sell, let's assume we could sell this tar sand oil somewhere, well, it'll be used for something. Either we're going to make plastic out of it or we're going to make fuel out of it and burn it. Right, so we have to stop. The IPCC report, the last one, clearly says we have to actually start developing. We have, it's wishful thinking. Basically, they think we need technology that removes carbon dioxide from the atmosphere in order to hit the 1.5 degree target. Well, how is that possible? 
Yeah, how is it possible? Because if we're continuing emit carbon dioxide. Yeah, 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 you yeah. can't not have your cake and eat it too, basically. Yeah. It doesn't work. We have to So stop. how is it possible? We have to stop. We have yeah, to we stop. have to stop. Yeah. So there is no future for this, this oil. This, from, there's exactly. no future because we have to stop. We, if, you wanted to, if you want a future for your children and grandchildren, yeah. we have to stop. Yeah. And the it's question really is, that simple. And the question is, Boy. so if you ask scientists, well, how much time do we have? Yes. They go, well, if you ask an economist, he'll give you one number. Yeah. And if you ask a scientist who is concerned about the future of the planet Earth, right. he'll give you another number. Okay, what and number? of course, the number that the scientist tells you, well, we have to be carbon neutral by 2040. Well, that's not very far away. And it's you already know. too late. Well, let's assume, let's assume there's an opportunity for human, humanity to save itself. Okay and everything else. Carbon neutral by 2040, okay. By 2040. Twen carbon neutral. Neutral, that okay. means, Wow. actually, actually zero, zero carbon, meaning we do no longer emit any more carbon. Yes. And in fact, we have to become not only carbon neutral, we have to become carbon negative. Right. We have to re reduce our carbon footprint to the point where we're actually removing more carbon from the atmosphere right. than we're putting out. And if we set our minds to it, we could probably do all of that and have a better life. Yeah, yeah. we could. Yeah. But obviously, people would have to be on board People have to be educated yeah. of what's at stake. Yeah. And the banks will, might not make enough money, so really that's that, what it comes that, down to. So, so here's the crux of the problem. The problem is that our economic model, and I think I've said this before on your show before, it wants economic growth. But, with this, but our growth economy is built on producing emissions. Carbon emissions have to be created in order to have economic growth because our system is based on fossil fuel extraction. That's how it's been based on. That's all we know. But unfortunately, we have to move away from that. And of course, nobody wants to hear that. And here's why. And here's a beautiful example. So This is an ice cube in a glass of water. We've only got a minute and a half, so you're going to have to Real run quick. through it. Yeah. Well, there's a phenomenon called the latent heat of water. And to put it shortly, if this is the ice at the North Pole, it acts as our air conditioning unit for the globe. And each summer, the ice has been shrinking more and more and more. So if you look at summer ice extent or... We don't have time. We've got about 40 seconds. 40 seconds. Once the ice goes, there goes the air conditioning unit for the globe. And we got maybe a couple of years okay. or three years but left. But also, if you have water, if you have ice that is at zero degrees, but it's ice, yes. it takes 80 calories of energy to change that ice from ice into water, even though the temperature is not changing. That's it's right. just changing from ice into water. Yeah. 80 calories of For one of gram energy. of ice. But once it's this. water, yes. that same 80 calories of energy that just changed it from ice to water, At zero once it is Celsius. water, that same 80 calories of energy will raise it 80 degrees. That's right. I mean, just think of what that means. Yeah, if the polar ice goes, that's what the Finnish Prime Minister said at the White House just a few months ago, there goes humanity. We didn't have time to hear about that, though, because there were more important things being said. Yeah. Ah, folks, we're in big trouble. I don't know what we can do about it, but uh, thank you for watching this segment of Citizens Forum. Welcome back to Citizens Forum, and today we have with us Mehdi Najari, and Mehdi has been doing a little bit of research on different things that have been happening around the province, and I think we could title this segment, uh, Pipelines, Politics, and Media Manipulation, because we have uh, all these different ingredients going into issues these days, particularly around uh, this pipeline debate. So welcome to the show, Mehdi. Thank you, Walter. So to start out with, let's just recap what's happened in the last couple of weeks with the Kinder Morgan pipeline. We can see that the government, for many years we have been saying that the definition of government, the function of government now is to manage the population while they are implementing corporate agenda. And this is exactly what a captured government by corporation is doing, is yeah. subsidizing with the public money that we need to spend on the public need, giving it away to the corporate interest. Yeah. And, and in the process also devast devastating the environment. Do you think like now, I mean, there's been a lot of people would say, oh, well, we're, we're, we're like a conspiracy theorists that, that this corporate you know, agenda really isn't, isn't as big as we're saying. Um, do you think that this recent development with the Trudeau government taking over this Kinder Morgan pipeline 
doesn't this sort of up the game a little bit? It's to subsidize a losing venture. Yeah. The Kinder Morgan was very happy, and all the maneuvering that they did in the last six months was to get rid of this asset because this asset is a liability in yeah. future. And that's what's happened here. At the same time, we don't have any evaluation of the value of this company that we bought. Where is the valuation of the report that said this company worth $4.5 billion? It's now, asset didn't Kinder Morgan evaluate their own uh, pipeline a few years ago? It was it was a five hundred million dollar. That's million. what they they said, and plus one point two billion dollar that they spent on this expansion project. Okay. But but we need to know we if we the public are paying, where is the valuation? But most important thing is what they are not talking about. Three weeks ago, Mike D'Souza of of National Observer revealed that uh, whistleblowers sent him document that yeah. showed that the whole process of approving Kinder Morgan pipeline was rigged. So how was it rigged? It, it was, as, as, as uh, Toronto Star put it, it said, an official instructed the staff to give a cabinet a legally sound base to say yes to, to Trans Mountain. So it was from the beginning they wanted to say yes, yeah. but they were looking for some report legally Based, you know, to, to give them that. The it's, issue always was how are we going to sell this to the public? E exa yeah. Exactly, how to manage the people. Yeah. And the same with, is true with the scientists. The, scient the scientific base wasn't there for this pipeline. In fact, Trudeau announced his approval of uh, Tinder Morgan and Line 3 pipeline based on rigorous debate on science and evidence. Yeah. But when the scientists ask him where is the scientific basis for decision, he is not providing it. No. It's a secret. When the science becomes secret, there is no science Pretty there. well. And, and, the, and, and the scientists like Thomas Sisk said, in the case of oil sand development, our study highlights substantial gap in scientific knowledge needed to support sound policy decision making. Yeah. We know they discuss our paper and they decided to ignore it and then told public that science show that the, the pipeline would be safe. Yeah. So it, it's all BS. They're making it all up. It's, 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 these guys are corrupt, the, our government. It yeah. doesn't matter in the federal level or provincial level, all captured by corporations. Now, and how is that now, when you're looking at, for instance, uh, what uh, Premier uh, Horgan is doing now to, uh, asking for clarifications on constitutional matters around who uh, has jurisdiction over the safety of the pipeline and all that. Now, is he not protecting our interests, it, Maddie? It's all uh, window dressing, in my opinion. They have done nothing to really seriously help. The most important case right now is the First Nation case. Yeah. Did the government is putting some money to help to f f First Nation case and hiring more lawyers and so on and so forth? No. What it is, the, uh, let me give you some other example to see yeah. if this government, is uh, John Horrigan government, is there to protect the BC environment and, and the public interest or not. They have this BC scientific inquiry into fracking. They yeah. lay that up, but it won't address the risk to public health. So they take that part of the important part of the effect of fracking on public health and LNG off the table. So we should not know about what effect it has on human health. And at the same time, it won't address the industry contribution to greenhouse. Yeah. So the most important thing is taken off the table and they have this science, so-called scientific. What are they addressing then? Uh, nonsense. It's, yeah. it, it's just window dressing. Another thing, in, in June 20th, the 20 three for, uh, fish farm licenses will be expired. Yeah. At the time that they talk, they give a lots of platitude to the, to the First Nation rights and uh, First Nation yeah. jurisdiction. Let's see if they stop. They would. They they will not. They would not yeah. uh, renew these licenses. I believe they will because they are corporate puppets. If they were working for the public interest at the time that the state of Washington get rid of the fish farm, at the time that the wild fish salmon runs are in danger, yeah. at the time that the orca is struggling because there is not chin chinook, 
yeah. and these fish farms have effect on wild salmon at the time that the First Nations saying, no, we don't want these fish farms in our traditional territory. Let's see what this government does. If it, yeah. is, if it doesn't renew them, then we say, okay, they are, they are getting serious here. But, yeah. it, but I believe they will renew them. Another example is the Columbia River Treaty. Yeah. There is a renewal, they, there is negotiation for renewal, but First Nation is not invited to the table. This is total betrayal of yeah. what they say, that they respect First Nation uh, rights. And when it's come to the point to, to practice what they say, they won't. So, you know, they're ignoring the First Nations concern federally as well as provincially. I mean, you hear the platitudes, and then when it comes straight, when the rubber hits the road, there's, there's nothing to be seen. It always concerned me when um, ex-politicians, ex-prime minister like... Um, uh, oh, I can't, I can't think of his name now. Was, was it the, the liberal prime minister around the, uh, before Harper? Uh, Martin? Martin. Yeah, he, he was working on a, in, in a, uh, for a, a company or working for a group that were educating uh, the First Nations people on how to get in on the economic benefits of pipelines. And uh, they seem to spend a lot of time, you know, trying to convince the First Nations people to sign on and all that. So we have that type of manipulation going on in the background too. Now, but I, I did want to touch on something else because we know uh, in, locally in, in, in Victoria, we have CFAX Radio that's been talking a lot pro-pipeline rhetoric the last few weeks. And uh, they're claiming that they have uh, all this evidence to show that this is a good idea. So how, how, how um, credible are, is there, that it, view? It has been for like uh, three, four months, actually. Yeah. There is, to me, it looks like there is a campaign of support for this pipeline by, yeah. by corporate media, and specifically CFAX, and specifically between nine and 12 every day, Adam Sterling is pushing this agenda. Yeah. Every day he come up with a sermon about the, why this pipeline is good for us and it is going to help. They, and in the process of doing this, they are saying that, for example, that there is a good business case. And today, this morning, they were talking. Who are they talking to? Yeah. Always with the same person. Markham Hislop, a blogger and lobbyist from Calgary. Uh, oil lobbyists. Oil lobbyists, okay. support of oil industry. They never bring anybody on the other side of the, uh, yeah. the, the ledger. For example, they ridicule anybody that say there is no business case for this pipeline. Yeah. And they, they bring some excuses that is all, not, in my opinion, nonsense. Yeah. And then when I, call, I used to call, now they don't allow me. For example, in last month, I, I, I was waiting another 30 minutes in one session, another 30 minutes in another session, 40 minutes in another session, while he is saying, I like to be challenged. And he knows I'm, I'm going to challenge him, but I'm not, he's not allowing me. So I asked before, why not having Robin Allen, economist Robin Allen, yeah. economic Jeffrey Rubin, and many other economists that say this is not a viable, yeah. um, viable industry, business. Yeah. They don't. The same true with the science. They say they, they uh, Mr. Adam Sterling know what the scientists are saying. And he say page 160 and 376 of the Royal Society. Yeah. But he really doesn't understand. He doesn't have a scientific background and so, uh, you know, to, to understand yeah. even the scientific paper. So we ask him again, why don't you bring a scientist? Why don't you bring one of the authors of that report to yeah. tell us what they are saying? He refused, yeah. you know? And there are scientists, many scientists, for, like the, Dr. David Schindler and others, that oh. are, are, are really world-class scientists yeah. that are opposing this. We, ha we had uh, four scientists, uh, uh, Stephanie Green, Wendy Palin, Thomas Sisk, and five other scientists written paper after paper, what's the problem with the, uh, with the pipeline and tar sand? Yeah. It's all ignored. So what they have done, Mr. Uh, Mr. Sterling and CFAX has done, there are three or four people that are always there on a weekly basis, sometimes two, two times. There is Mike Guggen on, on Monday. Who is Mike Guggen? He's a lobbyist. There is Markham Hislop, and they bring him again and again, a lobbyist and a blogger, 
from yeah. Calgary. And, and uh, Chris Sims of Canadian uh, Taxpayers Federation, another fake public interest group. Yeah. Though people don't know that the Canadian Taxpayers Federation is not a public interest group. It's a private company. And since their inception, since 1991, we, if we look, the corporate taxes has gone down, the people taxes has gone up. And, and, and they facilitate selling and por propagandizing the public for selling the public assets. Well, this how could it job. be good, like if you were advocating for, for tax, for fair taxes, which would mean less taxes for the average folk, how could they argue that this is going to be a good deal? Oh, that, that, that is how they are. But, but, <laughs> but the last thing I'd like to, to say is that the attack on environmentalists. Mr. Mr. Sterling and CFAX are saying that environmentalists are misinforming the public. Yeah. We ask, why don't you bring an environmentalist yeah. and, and, and lay out your char charges to, yeah. in their face? How cowardice? What yeah. level of cowardice does it take that you accuse people without allowing themselves to defend themselves? Yeah. For example, on, on, on May 21st, they were saying that Elizabeth May uh, misinforming the public, you know. It, this is this is a smear campaign yeah. by a bunch of losers, in my opinion, that yeah. cannot defend their their uh, their what they are saying, yeah. and and trying to poison public opinion. Yeah. And when people want to challenge them, they say it's a it's an open line. It's not. They don't allow people that can challenge them to talk. Well, on that note, Mehdi and and CFAX, you know. Uh, we hope that you will start treating these issues more fairly and, and give uh, people with another voice a chance to have a, a say on your uh, open talk radio. Uh, I think it's so important that people hear all views and, and uh, let the public decide what's the best thing. Mehdi, thank you so much again for coming in. We really appreciate it. Thank, uh, you. thank you for all the work you've done looking at these issues. And that completes this segment of Citizens Forum. Welcome back. It is still uh, June the 6th, Wednesday. We're going to be talking about an issue that I think is of tremendous importance, which is proportional representation. Our guest is Dr. Michael Prince from UVic. Um, so it is now June 6th. The, the ballot that we will be voting on in October and November right. uh, has now been released. A lot of people really don't know too much about it. Right. So maybe you can just... Give sure. Us the background. Well, as people may or may not know, and probably most don't yet, uh, the Attorney General was identified by the government to be sort of a neutral overseer of this process. What that means is that he is not participating in any of the NDP caucus meetings or cabinet meetings that have to do with the referendum. He's now produced a report based on the consultations that went on uh, through the winter. You know, extensive input from from a number of groups, uh, the usual suspects on both sides of the issue, but also a large base of web participation. He's now produced a report, Jack, with 18 recommendations. Some of the key ones are the all-important ballot question. We were, you know, people were speculating, is there going to be one short question? Is it going to be a two-part question? Which options, if any, around proportional representation would be identified? He's now making a recommendation to Cabinet, so it's not yet official. No, it's but, not. Okay. No, but we're expecting that uh, the government will probably endorse his recommendation. Are you happy with the ballot? Uh, I think so. I think he's tried to <clears throat> strike uh, uh, some balances here. People called for clarity. They said, if we're going to be asked a question, let's be clear as to what we're being asked. Let's keep it simple. Let's not be too complicated. Inevitably, though, you're going to have to get into some details and complexity at some point. So it's a two-part question. The first is to ask British Columbians simply, do you support maintaining the status quo first past the post system, or are you in favor of moving to some proportional representation voting system? That's question one. If, and as the government has laid out, if 50 plus 1 percent say yes to that first question, we go to the second question where people are being asked as well, three options on proportional representation. And without getting into details today, we've got plenty of time over the coming weeks and months to discuss it. One is what's called dual member proportional representation, basically where you elect two people in an existing district or riding. The next one is a mixed member system, which is uh, familiar to some people in Scotland and in other countries in Germany, Germany, Germany jurisdiction. And the third is a, an interesting hybrid called rural urban proportional re representation. 
And it's probably the most complex. It's got elements of single transferable vote. Remember STV for all those political junkies? That's a, uh, a little bit of mixed member and first past the post. So it's the most complicated of the three options. So people are being invited to vote for one, vote for two, vote for all three in a preferential ranking. And so that's, according to the government's view, that will give some clear sense of which option would be the most viable. Then that would be referred if the referendum passes to a legislative committee to hammer out the details this coming winter and, and to report before next March. So that's kind of the broad t timelines. We also know the campaign is to officially start July the 1st. Uh, that means regulating the advertising budgets takes effect then. So up until now, this show today to the end of the month of June, it's really sort of uh, free for all in terms of what kind of spending there may be on advertising. But as of July 1st, controlled budget spending on that as an election campaign. The votes on, well, as you said, the cam campaign starts July 1st. The voting period starts from October the 22nd, two days after municipal elections in our province, through to the end of November. So that's really, so I, I expect that the campaign really will get going in the fall after Labor Day, but uh, the organizations will hit the road running certainly uh, in early July. So, Michael, uh how are people going to be voting? Is it going to be online or mail-in ballot? Or? Far, well, ma mail-in ballot is what the government has been saying. And again, that'll be o overseen by Elections BC, the uh, neutral, objective, yeah. uh, nonpartisan uh, agency that administers this. Uh, they're still waiting to see regulations, again, as to what they're being mandated and asked to do. Uh, the Attorney General in his reports making recommendations. So that's giving some direction, but s certainly over the next coming weeks, they're, they're looking for very clear direction on what this mail-in ballot will look like and how they'll administer yeah. it. So as also, you know, you mentioned like it's a two-part uh, 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 question here, right. saying are, do you want to change the system and then what type of system do you want to change to? Say, uh, for instance, if uh, most of the people that voted wanted uh, mixed member proportional representation, that's the the option is that is, the, is the government bound to that or can they say oh no we don't quite like that idea we can go somewhere else is that a possibility uh, that's a possibility but I think the clear expectation is that they would be directed by the vote yeah um, and certainly having a, a fairly low threshold 50 percent plus one and that's, that's, not a, that's not a low threshold well, that's the threshold for every referendum in the world <laughs> except <laughs> the ones we had here in BC back yes, in yeah, 2005. Yeah, yeah, fair point Jack uh, so what we're seeing is the critics within our own province saying given what we've done t twice before uh, this is a different threshold but so I would think that the government in any way I mean they've been accused of making it mm -hmm. easy for change I mean, that's again a debatable point, but I would think that the expectation is that once the government rolls out the regulations, we'll see a firm commitment yeah. that if, the, if it passes and there's a clear choice, it will be referred to a standing legislative committee that will look into the more details. The other interesting thing is between now and then, uh, Elections BC is charged with providing factual information on the three options. And Good. again, the recommendations by the Attorney General are fairly high level at this <coughs> point. He's made certain commitments that, for example, uh, whichever option would be preferred, uh, there's a 5% threshold on popular vote. So the issue of fringe parties, some people are concerned that perhaps PR invites uh, a wide range of parties and fragment the vote. Yeah. Uh, again, like in most systems around the world, there's a threshold. 5% is a fairly standard one. Another pledge of the, or principle the uh, attorney so that general, means that in order, in order to begin to get seats in the legislature, you have to get at least 5% of the vote. Yeah. It's a fairly high standard, but at this point in time, I think we can deal with it, and it can yeah. be refined later if we want. Yeah, absolutely. And, and that's, again, one of the other uh, recommendations by the Attorney General is if a new system gets introduced, let's do it for two general election cycles and then have another uh, referendum on, on whatever the new uh, system may be. Let's, let's sort of you know, kick the tires, give it a drive around the block a couple of times, see yeah. how it goes. And basically sort of saying to people, this isn't a permanent forever. You know, again, trying to allay perhaps some people's discomfort about embracing a new change, moving in a new direction, saying this doesn't mean we can't review it at some point down the road. Well, I support proportional representation because I believe it's more democratic. Um, you wanted to talk a little bit about values or consequences. Sure. Uh, well, in terms of values, you're right. I mean, the, the key debate here is around proportionality and that our current system, the first past the post, some people praise it for stability or majority governments or its simplicity or uh, what I usually call familiarity. 
And I think a lot of people just have a comfort around it because that's what we, they've known. Uh, but on the other hand, in terms of representativeness or responsiveness, it, that's its major failing, is that we get very few majority governments with a true majority of the popular vote, and we don't get a true representation or translation of the votes cast across the province and who actually is representing you in the legislature. And, you know, we don't need to rehearse some of the arguments here, but we've had some pretty dramatic examples in this province of huge majority governments with, you know, well below 50% of the popular vote. It distorts the system. I also think that if we had proportional representation, the two major parties would split. I think the NDP would split into their union-dominated party that it now is. And as well, you'd get a hopefully social democratic environmental government a party that would have a lot of seats, that would have a lot of seats. And the liberals would split into the liberals and conservatives or whatever. And I think that's good. It, it, lets, it gives people a broader range where we, can, where we can vote. I think PR will give us, will give people, the, the citizens who live here, a little bit more power and the politicians and the one percent of the one percent who control everything it will give them a little less power and i think that's why we're seeing the beginnings of a very concerted attack against proportional representation by elements in the media and also um, by a, a group of i guess lobbyists or whatever mm -hmm. And, uh, and, and pretending to be our friends, pretending to be worried about democracy. It's not about, it's not that. They don't want any democracy. There is an enemy in this fight. And we had better remember that as we go along. Ah. Consequences of proportional representation. Sure. Will it change our society for the better? Uh, well, that's, that's the big debate, and that'll be part of the ongoing issues. For those people who uh, you know, argue for, and we've already seen it in letters to the editor and blog postings, people praising majority governments under the first past the post is to equate majority with stability or with democracy. And of course, we know those are not words we should just all see as those are interchangeable. Uh, I think you're right. Proportional representation uh, is an opportunity for a more diverse style of politics. Some would argue a more a consensual approach. Uh, certainly it would, it, it doesn't replace bargaining in politics, but it relocates it from within party systems and within party establishments to inter-party. So it makes it slightly more public and uh, it's not adding more politics to our democracy or more politics in the sense of bargaining and negotiating. To me, it's, it's just relocating it and putting it into a little bit more of the daylight and more into the public view. And I think when you think of it that way, that's probably not a bad thing. So whether, it, the other thing, Jack, is you, you touched on, is over time, if this does stay in place, uh, it will likely shift our behaviors and our expectations around how we conduct politics, how our party should behave. Parties still up until fairly recently, in not only BC, but in most provinces, are still private organizations. They're like clubs. They're not public service organizations. And we're seeing now with more rules around advertising and fundraising and disclosure, we're expecting a higher level of accountability and transparency of our political parties. And what PR does is take that to a further level around, for example, if we're gonna have PR lists of candidates where you get to choose from a provincial or regional list of candidates in a multi-member writing system, for example, Again, there'll be more transparency, accountability of how those candidates are selected and empowering the citizen to pick from the list rather than the parties getting to manage the lists themselves. We've only got two minutes left. I think sure. you had one more. Well, you know, the, we're kind of getting into this and probably don't have enough time, but sure. the, the issue around uh, how the leader of the party would then become the prime minister or the premier, and a lot of times that process is not fully democratic. Right. And... Uh, do you think proportional representation might take a little bit of power away from the leaders of the parties? Well, it, it, it could. I mean, what they certainly have to do is learn how to bargain. And, and we're seeing that in a way with the, uh, the confidence and supply agreement between the NDP and the Green Party right yeah. now in our province is in a way, some might call it a, a, a sneak preview or a, or a test piloting of what uh, two parties working together. We have very little experience of multi-party government or yeah. coalition government in this country, certainly at the provincial level. So uh, the longer that plays out, people are getting a chance to see that perhaps there is an inherent instability to it. There isn't a chaos that's flowing from it. I mean, there's still political choices being made and policy decisions, yeah. tough ones and, and some other ones that are more popular. But 
Uh, again, I think it's going to take a lot of public education and dialogue. And, and it, one of the other recommendations is that there be half a million dollars allocated to a, a group that's a proponent for PR and half a million dollars to a group that's an op opponent. And as we saw in the 2009 referendum. So again, that should be up and running hopefully in the next uh, month or so. And in addition to those two groups, Elections BC will be charged with providing more neutral, factual information, including perhaps boundary maps. Because I think a lot of people are wanting, want to look at what will it mean to my constituency. The other last point I want to make is all of these options include elements of first past the post. None of these are getting rid completely yeah. of first past the post. That's an important point I think to make to British. So Columbia. we will still be able to elect our own directly elected person. Uh, yeah. We're out of time. Walter, sure. thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. And thank you for what this is a very important issue. Let's follow up on it as best we can. Thank you for watching this segment of Citizens Forum. Welcome back. Uh, I'd like to just once again thank our volunteer crew and the Shaw staff that makes this program happen every couple of weeks. Um, just as a follow-up to the interview with Michael Prince, there's going to be a TV show uh, starting soon on Channel 4 on our community station talking about uh, proportional representation and the upcoming referendum on changing our voting system or not. Um, the program is going to be called Voting for Change and we're not sure exactly when it's going to start, but it's starting soon, so please stay tuned. And um, Walter, a throwback to the days of Christy Clark, the good old days. Well, it seems some stories you just can't quite shake them, you know, Jack, it get on and on it goes, and be, lots, lots of uh, column spaces being eaten up in the media, corporate media, regarding the, uh, the health scandal in 2011 when the health care workers were fired by the provincial government on trumped up charges that they had breached of a code of conduct around the use of information in research. None of those, none of these allegations were ever shown to have any merit whatsoever. They had nothing. They just was. No, there didn't seem to be any evidence whatsoever, even why they even came up with the idea. There seemed to be no reason for the whole thing. There was never any reason given. And, and uh, we have a new an article here that was in the Times Colonist, uh, Sunday, May twenty seventh. Former uh, BC Health Minister opens up over firing scandal. And Margaret Mc McDermott, who took over the uh, Ministry uh, of Health, uh, uh, two days before she made the announcement that there had been this breach of privacy. So she took over, she was given this information and she acted. Immediately, the first thing that happened to her was she was briefed about this and she was, uh, you know, basically told that she, you're going to go on air and you're going to explain to the BC public uh, this terrible situation that we're in. Now but obviously this wasn't new and the previous minister under whom all of this whatever had happened was? Mike DeJong. Mike DeJong. So take that for what it is. Uh, it looks like the minister herself was set up, as far as I'm concerned. Now the story, I, let's try to be fair, but in the end you do have to speculate a little bit. What actually was happening here? We had a group of uh, people called the Therapeutics Initiative here in British Columbia who look over drugs and the use of drugs and they uh, recommend to the government whether or not they, these drugs should be covered under the BC health care plan. And they're one of the very few independent groups that actually has enough money to do independent, non-corporate research yeah. on drugs. And they, they have saved British Columbians tens of millions of dollars. And no doubt many, many health many problems lives. as well. It's a, really, every, every civilized society should have a group like this. But the thing is, is that they were all looking into the effectiveness of smoking cessation drugs, and in particular, they're looking at the effectiveness of, of Champix, which is a Pfizer product. Now, I have to say, this appears to be the way it is. I know Pfizer is going to be setting up and wondering what we're going to say about them, but it sure appears to me like that uh, they were getting a lot of flack for this drug worldwide, and there's lawsuits against them all over the place. And here they are in BC, maybe getting coverage under the health care plan. And, uh, out came, comes, is coming this information from the Therapeutics Initiative and others that's saying that this drug may not be safe. So it appears that they just had to get rid of these guys. They had to shut them up 
and uh, on with business as usual. So I th what happened was this, these firings and w what happened around it basically shut down for a while some of the work that the therapeutics initiative was doing. Well, as I say, this appears to be the case. Now, how much work they were doing, what the report looked like, nothing ever came out from it afterwards. Now, the sad part of this is right in the midst of this, one of the researchers, Rodney McCasick, a PhD candidate, uh, just finishing his PhD, uh, he committed suicide. And uh, the, it seemed to be the major stress on his life was the fact that he was fired and accused of breach of trust and things by the government. Um, the thing to remember about this apparent suicide is it took the coroner's office six months to decide that it was a suicide. It took them six months to rule that it was a suicide. Is that unusual? Highly unusual, all, almost unprecedented. So let's just say that it wasn't a cut and dried case that this was a suicide, that there were other circumstances that took them six months to consider uh, but they finally did rule it as, as a suicide. Now, we should be concerned about that also. You know, uh, we don't know for sure what went on behind the scenes, but the bottom line here is, is that uh, we get miles of column space talking about all these different aspects of this scandal, but they don't really get to the nub of it. What actually was really happening? Now, it really does look like this was happening, that the that, that, these drug companies were standing to lose a lot of money. Well, that's a fact. And that'd be worldwide. So we're not talking about millions, we're talking about billions of dollars in profits, as well as uh, billions of dollars in liability and lawsuits. They were looking at some pretty big issues. And this, in British Columbia, it was looking like we had some research that showed that their, their um, product was not only non-effective, but also dangerous to use. Okay, so if that was the case, then why didn't, did that research come out? It never came out. As far as I know, it didn't come out. I was looking today to try to find it. Now, it may have come out, but I can't find it. And uh, what I always think about when I see these stories is that it's like the much to do about nothing kind of thing. Why are they talking and talking about this? It's because they're preoccupied with, I think, hiding the truth. So they I have would to agree. muddle the facts in any way they can. I mean, the things that go on in this province are so horrendous. And yeah. because we don't really have a democracy anymore, we have a sort of corporate dictatorship that owns the media and controls the politicians. These are the kinds of things that happen. And not only this, I mean, in northeastern BC, the gas and oil industry are poisoning people. I mean, people's lives are being completely ruined by this. Out of, it's like Nigeria, probably. Exactly. Well, let's look at some more strangeness, Jack. Uh, the health care critic at the time was Adrian Dix. And Adrian Dix said if the, that the Liberal government should have an inquiry into what actually happened. Well, Adrian Dix now is the Minister of Health. So, Mr. Dix, now is the time to act. Why don't you get to the bottom of this? Is what I'm saying and what others are interpreting has really happened? Is this the issue or is this something else entirely? We really don't have the ability to get to all these facts, but an inquiry could do that, and I think it's very important that they do that. You know, Walter, I mean, what you're saying, and, and, and I agree with what you're saying, it just shows the depth of the corruption yeah. in this province. Okay, let's get into some more strangeness of it, because I'm just looking over these notes. Um, right from the get-go, the government said, yeah, there's um, improprieties and illeg Ill illegalities have happened and we're calling in the RCMP to do an investigation and there's, there's this ongoing investigation. The RCMP never did an investigation. And some say, some RCMP are saying that there was never any basis to even start an investigation as far as they could tell. So but who said there was an investigation? Uh, everybody in the Liberal Party, including Christy Clark and all that, we're saying that, the, that, that there's going to be this investigation or there is an ongoing investigation, but there never was. Well, now that we've said this on television and the media can at least get the idea, and maybe they'll say, well, wait a second, is there more to this story? Yeah. Now, they know the story. They know the story better than we know the story. They just can't say the story 
because the corporate media is the corporate media. It is not our friend. It is not out after the truth. It's out to protect the interests of the corporation. Okay, let, I'll just give you one more tidbit because there's so much. But in 2011, May 9, 2011, I remember this press conference. I Googled it and sure enough, up it came. Christy Clark announcing that the government is going to uh, fund uh, smoking cessation drugs like uh, nicotine patches and gum. So uh, it sounded like they're going to uh, allow Champix and other, those other types of drugs that, by the way, have no nicotine in them. Those drugs were, were, were psychoactive drugs that were used for other, other types of uh, health conditions, which they decided, oh, by the way, you know, it might help people quit smoking too. But by the way, there's been hundreds and hundreds of cases of suicidal tendencies. There's been many, many suicides that have been attributed to that drug. And there are lawsuits being fought all over the world about that. So is this drug now part of our... It's still around. The drug is still here in BC. Used. Yeah. Are, is it a, is it part of the smoking cessation pro program being run by the government or something? Uh, as far or? as I know, it isn't. But I, I you, you, but can't you can not find that out online. Okay. But so, it is available. You can buy it. Oh yeah. People are using you, you it. You can still guess. use this uh, drug legally. I think and I saw all that. it advertised on TV not that long ago. Maybe from the states. I'm not sure. Yeah. You know, it's it's really a, it's a story that has all the strangeness in it that. It leaves us here speculating, really. Uh, but I think it's fair, totally fair comment. If you look at the evidence in front of you, that that's the facts have been given to the public as we know them. Obviously, if it wasn't that there was a this, this breach of privacy and all that, you have to ask the question, well, what is going on? Why did they do this? This That question has never been addressed. So it, yeah. we deserve, if uh, what I'm saying is wrong, I'd be happily I would happily be, be proven wrong and shown to be wrong. But we, the story has not gone away yet because there's just too many questions up in the air. And the main question is, why won't anybody ask that question? <laughs> I know. It's, it's, the strangest of it is, 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 is what compels me to continue on looking into it. And it just it delves right into the depths of what's wrong with with the people who run our our our, our government yeah i mean adrian dix i think you said earlier when he was the critic wanted investigation that's right and he now he's a public inquiry public inquiry now he's the minister of health and no public inquiry i mean how much more hopeless can it get than that it just never <laughs> changes we've that's why they don't want pr because PR would split the NDP in two, and out of it we might get a, 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 a true party that represents the people. And the Liberals would do the same. Maybe they'd get something on their side too. Yeah. God help us. Well, that's the only thing I brought in for you today, Jack. Well, luckily we're just about out of time. Have I got him? I think, okay. Um, this is interesting. It's kind of, one minute. It's kind of the same thing. I saw, I heard Trudeau in Alberta on CBC. He was saying this project, talking about Kinder Morgan, is an investment in jobs here in Alberta. But the Alberta Federation of Labor opposed the Kinder Morgan pipeline because it was bad for jobs in Alberta. And so did Unifor, which is a union representing 12,000 people in the energy sector. They opposed the Kinder Morgan pipeline because it was bad for jobs. But John Horgan won't say that. The yeah. media won't say that. Even the unions won't say it. I mean, they're <laughs> silent, but it's fact. So we see, as in that case yeah. with, the, with the smoking drug, yeah. it's just crazy. And maybe we'll leave it on that. Walt, thank you very much. You're welcome, Jack. And we have one last part coming up on Citizens Forum. Uh, so thank you for watching and one last part to come. My name is Sheila Mack, and I'm here to give a eulogy for the late John Shulman. And there he is, over there, sitting next to me. This card was made in 2004. 2004. Uh, well, anyway, it was his last day at the street news. And there was, uh, there's a little note inside, and I'll just read that. Uh, this is going back before he joined the megaphone. 
I'm so inspired by John's attitude to keep moving. In place of watching TV, I decided to leave TV, you all know about that, in favor of exploring small local enterprises with my camera in hand. And simultaneously, while this was going on, I was getting encouragement from the collaborator I have and doing my cards or posters or whatever it is. And her name is Elaine at Monk Office. And she did the, as the camera will show you, she did the uh, poster of John. And uh, well, I did the photography and she put it together. Okay, hi, I'm Mark Kitzak and I'm gonna read a poem about Big John because Big John was quite a special man and it's not about all these rich people sometimes or all these people that make the cover of the Rolling Stone or Time or Forbes magazine, but it's about the people that really mean a lot, like, like um, the little lady at the store that gives flowers to, to all the young couples, or, um, and even like some people like um, Alex who passed away, and they, they really helped a lot of people, David on the street, and especially was Big John. He always had time for you. You know, like downtown, it could be like a little ant colony, like a lot of people moving in a little state and uh, uh, like a glorified ant colony. And here was a person that made a difference. A large, loquacious man sits on his bench outside the busy Bay Center, proudly holding his paper, Victoria Street News, then the megaphone. This learned man in the know knows about every subject, including Betty Davis and Judy Dench full of life, laughter, and fire. This man sells the paper well, and he gives hell. In most busy, like I said, downtown uh, centers, people are moving around, but Big John was a welcome downtown fixture. Underneath the gruff exterior, John was a dedicated down-to-earth man with a heart of gold. He knows what he's talking about, helping people along the way in what he's got to say. Now Big John has gone away, and we are left astray to never find another as Big John. He was right on. We miss you, Big John, as God has you working on that glory press or the glorious megaphone. And all I got to say is just, Big John, Big John, you're right on. We miss you, Big John.